today's webinar. Today we're going to talk about the Shibboleth IDP UI. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to attend this session. My name is Sharice Arrowood, and I'm the Senior Director of Identity and Access Management at Unicon. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. The desired goals from the session today are to share the benefits of how the Shibboleth IDP UI can resolve some of those existing pain points that many of you deal with day after day. Today you're going to hear about how the Shibboleth IDP UI provides a streamlined workflow along with informational pop-up content throughout the application to help your IDP manage navigation through their tasks ending in success. Our goal is to make sure we help those IDP managers um, make things easier as they move forward. Additionally, feedback is essential. So one of the things we're going to be looking for, and you'll hear throughout the discussion, is that we want to hear what you have to say. We're asking for you to try out the Shibboleth IDP UI. Share your experiences with us about what works, what doesn't work, and what's missing. We need community guidance on the extended value add. We're looking to create a roadmap for next steps for the Shibboleth IDP UI. We want to help remove obstacles and provide a product that's useful and valued. I'd like to introduce you to Jonathan Johnson. Most of you know him as JJ, one of our senior IAM software engineers. He's going to share more about the opportunity available with the Shibboleth IDP UI. JJ? Hey, thanks, Sharice. <clears throat> so as someone that's been involved with several identity provider deployments, the problems that most folks run into can generally be put into two groups problems with the initial deployment, and problems in ongoing maintenance. So of course, this isn't unique to the Shibboleth IDP, and it's generally the case for any enterprise application. One nice thing, though, is that usually you only have to deploy an application once, and you don't have to worry about that initial configuration again. Unfortunately, just installing something like the IDP isn't all an operator has to do. Eventually, someone's going to come along and take, want to take advantage of that IDP, and the IDP operator will have to work to make that happen. These ongoing maintenance costs can quickly add up. Add to that the fact that most operators have other responsibilities, and the costs start to include context switching and, admittedly, refreshing your memory on something that you might not have done in days or weeks or even months. Right now, the Shibboleth IDP UI application can help lower the ongoing maintenance cost by helping an operator manage metadata and the metadata providers for their IDP. We've all been there. Show up to work on Monday morning with an email with the subject line urgent saying we need to set up some great new application to use Shibboleth, along with you know, several dozen other urgent requests. Depending upon how you have your IDP configured and the relying party requirements, this could be as simple as dropping a metadata file into place on the server, or it could involve making several changes to several files along with possible server outages. With the Shibboleth IDP 3.4, the IDP provides some new facilities that you can use to help alleviate some of these headaches with metadata-driven configuration and the Shibboleth IDP UI will help you take advantage of these facilities. The application allows a user to upload a provided metadata file or walk through a wizard to create a metadata file for a service that doesn't provide one. And of course, we've all run into those service providers. From that point, an admin can then manage all metadata through a consistent interface. So let's say you want to integrate a simple application. The application owner provides you with a metadata file and tells you they want to get an identifier, the first name, and last name back from the IDP. Previously, you would have to go back to your IDP, set up a metadata provider for the metadata file, check your attribute resolver file for the IDs of the attributes that you want to return, and possibly defining some new attributes, and add rules to your attribute filters to return those attributes. Granted, this is kind of a con contrived example, and there were ways to doing this that were pretty simple in previous versions of the IDP. But now, with some of the recommended, recommended standards that have come out, all this, except for the metadata provider configuration, can be driven through the metadata itself. You add a couple of entity attributes to the metadata, to tell the IDP what attributes you want to release. 
drop a meta file, metadata file into a local dynamic metadata provider directory, and the IDP will pick up the file and configure itself for you. And since these are standard recommendations, it's easy to create a user interface to take advantage of it. Now, releasing attributes is as easy as checking a box. After configuring the IDP UI with a list of attributes your IDP supports, it can provide a checkbox list allowing you to easily choose which attributes you want to release. Easy configuration isn't limited to just attribute filtering either. Now you can control how the response is signed or encrypted, what name ID format to return, whether to do MFA, whether to force authentication, and if you're adventurous, wire in your own custom attributes. Of course, to integrate a metadata file into your IDP, you must have a metadata provider. UI provides a way to manage the most important and often used types of metadata providers through a combination of wizards and consistent editors. Beyond the regular configuration that IDP operators might be familiar with, the UI also exposes some new features available in Shibboleth IDP 3.4. So, you're a member of a federation and everything is working great with whatever standard configuration you have for your federated relying parties. Then along comes application X that is also a part of the federation but has some unique needs. Say they want you to pass back a user's middle name. Off you go to your attribute filter to set up one, one more one-off rule for this application, right? Not anymore. Because of metadata-driven configuration, you can add an entity attribute to this metadata file that tells the IDP to send the middle name. But how do you do this without modifying the metadata file, like with a federated metadata aggregate? New in the Shibboleth IDP is the ability to modify metadata at load time through the use of a metadata filter. Now, everything that you could do with, with metadata, and by extension, the UI, is available to, available to you in your metadata providers. Just like you could do with a metadata file, you can add an entity attribute to control returning attributes, security, and whatever else you might have configured in, in your system, targeting entities by either ID, regular expression, or some script. So, we've described how the Shibboleth IDP UI works, now this is where you come in. So let's take a little bit of time here to uh, get any questions or any feedback that you might have. We'll check the chat now and we'll give you a little bit of time to paste those or post those out there for us. All right, well, while they're thinking of questions, I think we'll go ahead and continue with a little bit more and then we'll be happy to have some discussion towards the end of this webinar. So as JJ mentioned, this is where you come in. Um, this is where we really need your help. As a Shibboleth IDP UI community project, we're looking to make sure that we are driven by community needs. There are a few ways that you can help out. Let's discuss those options. First, you can download and test drive the application. So deploy it, configure it, try it out. Let us know how it works. There are several ways for you to actually run the application. And for information about the available options, they can be found on the wiki. The link is provided on the slide and will be posted in the chat window shortly. Additionally, this link will be made available following the presentation on the Unicon website and the Unicon's YouTube channel. Next, send us feedback. This is critical. Of course, we want you to try it out, but we need that feedback. We want to know um, how things work for you. The link is provided in the webinar and again will be posted in the chat window shortly. Your feedback is key and will help us align next steps on the roadmap for the Shibboleth IDP UI. We want to meet community needs and we want to ensure overall growth and expansion based on where it adds value to you as the users. For some additional information, we're providing a link to the Shibboleth IDP UI data sheet. Watch for an upcoming, uh, watch for the, the update in the chat window shortly. We will make sure you have access to that. Lastly, please watch for an upcoming Shibboleth IDP UI functional webinar in the near future. So that's where we're actually going to take you 
from the beginning to the end as to where we are right now, and it's exact, and that's exactly what's available to you today if you go to the wiki, as we mentioned earlier, and you were to check that out, deploy it, and configure it. So watch for an upcoming um, notification to let you know about that functional webinar. Let's go ahead and open it up for a discussion on the SHIB UI IDP. So first question that we had out there, could the IDP UI exist without the metadata-driven configuration features enabled by SHIB IDP 3.4? The answer to that question is a qualified yes. There are a lot of features that we take advantage of that are specific to the uh, metadata-driven configuration. And if you saw those little pictures that were flashing up earlier, we kind of flash those up there a little quick so that you don't like quickly focus or, you know, hone in on those. We want you all to become engaged here, download the application and come to some further webinars. But you'll notice in there that a lot of the slides, particularly for the metadata management, are just the sort of things that you would use in regular, meta in regular metadata writing anyways. It provides a user interface for creating a metadata XML file. You could go out there and remove the screens that actually present those uh, metadata-driven configuration options. I mean, you lose some value there, but that's, that is an option for you. You could also manage your metadata providers as well, again, you would not have access to the new metadata-driven configuration stuff if you don't have it turned on. But yes, you could actually go out there and generate a metadata providers file that you could use in 3.3. You could generate metadata files that you can use in 3.3. You just could not take advantage of those new features in 3.3 that are in 3.4 or if you don't have them turned on in 3.4, you just couldn't take advantage of them. So is that, does that answer your question there? GLB 443, I think, I hope. Like Great, it. thanks. Uh, next question out there, how well does this work with a mature, i.e. grown organically over the years, configuration? Do we have to start over? The nice thing about this and, you know, kind of, one, some of the proof of concept things that I have actually done over the last year is kind of marrying this up with or partnering this up with configuration that you might already have out there. So the proof of concept is say you already have a metadata providers XML file out there that you've, that you've had, you know, for years, maybe you have an attribute filter file out there that you've, you've used it for all of your federated members, those sorts of things already. You're happy, whatever. Shibboleth actually provides a way to add extra attribute filters files. It also provides a way to add extra metadata providers files. So what you could do is you could have a section <coughs> of your IDP driven by the IDP UI while still maintaining the stuff that you've already have out there. So it is a, it is a con configuration concern and it is something that you would have to actually be a little bit conscious of, but there is no reason why you could not have the two sitting side by side. And, you know, maybe eventually you decide to move everything over to using the UI for configuration you're not forced to do it all at once. So I hope that answers your question there, Les. Uh, to answer your question, Jeremy, which is kind of a, a follow on there, is there a way to migrate the legacy configurations? Not really right now, just because they are significantly different. Uh, as I said, you could start you could add in the configuration bits that you would need going forward and then migrate over time. That is an option. Another option would be going in yourself. Since a lot of this is just metadata, you do have the ability in our system to up upload metadata files 
and manage those metadata files through the UI. Now, one of the things that we did not talk about and we will talk about, and this, this is kind of a teaser for something later, is the delegated administrative functions of the Shibboleth IDP UI. So say you have central IAM that's running you know, your IDP, you could go out there and allow other users in your institution to sign in and create their own metadata for you to go out there and approve and integrate into your system. So just a sneak peek for something later on, whet your appetite a little bit. Yeah, we do actually have some delegated administrative tasks out there. So hopefully I hit everything there that Les and Jeremy were looking for. Yep, looks like you did. Thanks, JJ. Yeah, I mean, is, is there anything else that you're, you're curious about there? I mean, yeah, feel free to put it out there in chat. I'm still scanning here, here for other questions. Yeah, there's additional. So the question on Java 8, I think right now is just a, an underlying library requirement. I personally use Java 11 where, where possible. So yes, we know, we know right now that there is a problem with running it on anything later than Java 8. That is on our roadmap to make sure that we get that fixed. And hopefully soon because yes, the Oracle licensing shenanigans are you know, pretty important. Uh, no, this does, okay, so Liam asks, does this generate an aggregate file? Does it need standalone metadata providers to find? Does it use local dynamic metadata provider directory full of metadata files? No, it does not generate an aggregate file. It will, it will generate a bunch of metadata files that could actually be integrated in a couple of ways. And again, sneak peek, Wet your appetite. The recommend one of the recommendations that we have is to use, as he mentions there, the local dynamic metadata provider, which allows you to drop a metadata file into a directory and the IDP will pick it up. Another thing that we have integrated into this application that is not widely advertised is it can actually act as an MDQ server, a metadata query server. So you could actually hook up a, oh, a dynamic HTTP metadata provider to, a, to an endpoint on the SHIB IDP UI and treat it as an MDQ server. So does that help, Liam? Cool. Steve Zoppi question, uh, mentions about OpenJDK. And yes, yeah, it, it, there are other talks out there. The and Steve, you'll have to correct me here because I never remember what it's called now. I, I've been told it's not called, we're not allowed to call it ITAP or TAP. It's the new, the new tier, folks. They have an architectural committee that is discussing what are the recommended JDKs out there. And we actually, okay, there, thanks. The Uncommon Trusted Access Platform. Yes, they, uh, they are discussing this very heavily to make recommendations. And I know that, um, I mean, the question pops up on the Shibboleth mailing list as well. So keep a lookout for, for that. Any of the Docker images that we provide are gonna be using the recommended JDKs anyways. So if you're, you're looking at that, uh, you should be fine. Got a question here, does this work in a CAS 6 environment? Mm -hmm. Some of the functionality, and I know this is probably not the right venue for this, some of the functionality is useful for CAS 6, uh, particularly the metadata generation, if you're dealing with something like, you know, the Google Apps for your domain or Google for Education where they don't provide a metadata file. It could provide a way for a user to go out there and create that metadata file. Uh, but beyond that, CAS 6 right now does not take advantage of anything like entity attributes in the metadata providers file. Uh, it doesn't use a metadata providers.xml file that would need to be uh, 
uh, generated for it to consume. So there is just really only one place where it would be useful for CAS6 at this time. Hopefully that answers your question there. And unfortunately, I can't see everyone's full names here. All I see is JWE. Yep, cool. Yes, yeah, yeah, the new name is, yeah, it's just not tier. It's, yeah, it's the in, in common trusted access platform. And I, yeah, I, I never remember because I remember back when it was Cypher and I still call it Cypher every once in a while. So we have about three minutes left. Uh, I would certainly encourage you all to go out there and check out the links that were posted in the chat. Uh, make sure that you go out there and download it. One other thing, be on the lookout for a mailing list. I don't think we have a dedicated mailing list right now, but I'm sure we will get something out there uh, post haste for folks to send you know, questions start interacting with the community. Again, we will send information about any further webinars. Oh, looks like we have, let's see, one more question that popped up. JJ, can you address that? I'm looking for the question right now. The, the MDQ option is attractive. Oh, yeah, so do. creating an aggregate. There are actually some other options out there for aggregates that are just outside of the scope of this of this particular project. I mean, if you're if you're willing to, you know, contact us, we might be able to help you out. But there are things that there are other applications out there that you can use for that. All right. Anything final before we wrap it up? Thank you so much for your attendance and your participation. We look forward to hearing your feedback. That was one of the links that I posted in the chat. Um, and again, watch for the functional webinar that we will be um, posting information on within the next couple weeks. So on, by, on behalf of JJ and myself, uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone.